My name is Kevin Martin, and I'm here with Heather Barrett. Uh, this is a Hitchhiker's Guide to Pre Precision Viticulture. I want to thank all of you for joining us and hanging with us while we figure out this audio issue. And um, here we go. So we've had a few years now of variable rate technology experience, particularly in the Lake Erie region. We actually started before this efficient vineyard project began with uh, some preliminary studies. So we're actually starting to see some grower adoption in our region. Um, and it's really picked up in the past couple of years. And probably in 2017, we actually started seeing growers implement this technology in a, in a big way in terms of acreage. Um, and adoption has looked different for all growers. And I would encourage growers to go about adoption in a way that suits your business and needs and farming practices. So this is a very big country. And um, we have some models that work very well in the, in the East. And that's basically based on the economic drivers of bulk production in a cool climate viticulture arena. And as you move away from those variables, the production practices that are most important to you economically certainly have the potential to change. Uh, and that's gonna change the suite of technology and production practices that should be controlled in a variable way uh, as you move as you change to different vineyard conditions. Uh, and we'll get into what I mean by that a little bit. Um, so as as the efficient project vineyard project nears its end, the work on commercialization is going to continue past the end of that. Uh, we'll have extension educators, certainly in our region, and we hope to share this information with other extension educators uh, so we can see this continue despite the fact that the project will, will end over the course of the next year. Um, so we have, the, the reason I, I focus on this uh, is as we see growers adopt, uh, we see sort of two models in the Lake Erie region. They, they sort of adopt everything or they focus on fertilizer spreaders. And I, we've sort of come up with a model that I think might be a better place to start. Uh, it's not that they're not having su success with this technology and it, it's not that they're not excited about it. And I, I certainly don't want to take away from that. But for our growers who haven't gotten into it, um, we'd like to sort of learn from, from the lessons that have happened over the last four years to try to make this as successful as possible for you. Um, so in terms of efficient adoption for us, uh, we're looking at controlling, um, we're really focused on crop load management. And the theory behind that is it offers the greatest return on investment. Um, it, the, the data continues to support this theory and real world adoption has been greater than that. But for the most part, we start to see a real savings and return on investment when we do uh, late season crop load management. So at least in our region, we're not doing a lot of canopy management. Um, we, we can do canopy management, we can do a variable rate fertilizer, but the, the return on investment is significantly higher with crop load management. So I wanna talk a little bit about what it takes to just do crop load management. So, so really the first thing you need is a way to take fruit off in a variable way. And the cheapest way to do this for most of our growers, uh, if, and what I mean by most of our growers is growers who already have a harvester. Um, they can control a harvester uh, with management zones and GPS and flow controllers and, and a display. Uh, what they do is they vary the speed of the bow rods uh, and they invest about $10,500 to $12,000 in a system like that and about $3,000 of that equipment is permanently installed. The rest of it, if you're familiar with some of this technology, is the display that's shown in the slide uh, and a GPS unit. Most of our growers are adopting the higher quality GPS, whether they need it or not. I think it's, it's more from a, they get to work with the, the same dealer and they get to have a plug and play system that they're comfortable with. So that does increase the price a little bit than what we, anticipated to that 10,500 uh, kind of a barrier, but it does seem to be what the growers are adopting and we haven't seen any growers use inexpensive GPS so far. Um, now the GPS and display, they're easily removed from the harvester. They can be installed on other tractors. So it's important to keep in mind 
while we're while I'm saying you should start here, um, you do have a significant amount of of capital invested in technology that you can move around and use for other things. Um, this system is pretty basic and we would use predicted yield based on targeted hand sampling and NDVI data. Um, that's really all you need to get started. You don't actually need a yield monitor and uh, actual crop load wouldn't be mapped without that yield monitor. So you're not gonna have a report card at the end of the year, but you're gonna have a better crop estimate and you're gonna have better results with your fruit thinning. Uh, so in terms of actual data to make this decision, you need some sort of measurement. And what we rely on is NDVI or NDRE, whatever we can get with our crop circle. Uh, there's a picture of that shown. Terry's mounting it on an ATV here. In the foreground, you can sort of see a data logger that comes with that. Uh, and that's one way to go with a crop circle. Um, now that being said, uh, one of the things Heather's gonna talk about a little bit later is a loaner sensor program. And sort of the foundation of that loaner sensor program is this crop circle and data logger. Uh, we can provide that to uh, regional growers that are interested in it in our area. And in the first two to three years, I think it's more than adequate. If, you, if you're an extension agent somewhere, you can, you can pursue something like that. Um, and I think the next logical upgrade after you get your harvester going would be to purchase your own canopy sensor. So what that would offer is three to six scans per season once you own it yourself. Um, you're definitely going to want that level of data as you start to adopt more va variable rate management practices. Um, and uh, you're going to also want to make sure you select a, a sensor that works for you. And so one of the things we had is we had a number of growers find uh, some canopy sensors online and the canopy sensors they purchased were not uh, able to work with the data loggers that they had. Uh, so you want to make sure that there's there's no compatibility issues when you're purchasing used equipment online. Uh, obviously, if you buy new from a dealer, you're going to get that information. Uh, and to do that, you're looking at a budget of about $4,000 to $6,000. Uh, our crop circle is actually a little bit more expensive because we've got that data logger. Uh, if you were to adopt in the way that I'm describing, you would already have a data logger built into that display that you purchased for your harvester. You'd already have the GPS as well. So even though the crop circle is probably, it does give you better data. It gives you more, more data, um, but it, uh, it's a little bit like you can see the cables we've got set up there. Uh, you can see the, the size of the display on that data logger. It's not something that's as user friendly for some of our growers. Uh, so, so despite that, it is a little bit more expensive because it is a standalone system for that price. Um, and then the next logical upgrade is gonna be that yield monitor. So the report card that you wouldn't have, the next thing you can do is you could start to get it. Uh, you know, a yield monitor, in addition to that, that crop load map at the end of the season that you're able to calculate. Um, it's also a valuable tool for sampling and calibrating fruit thinning activities and allows you to map the, map the fruit that's actually being thinned potentially. It does take some calibration to do that. And I would say, you know, growers have some mixed results in their first year and probably excellent results by their second year. Um, so this is a larger investment and that's why I think it, it does make sense to try to um, if you're if you're getting involved slowly, try to push this off for a year or two. Uh, the good news is, as compared to 2014 or 2008, depending on what type of product. So when we started this work, and then when we formally started Efficient Vineyard, the good news is since then these are really pretty well commercialized. Uh, I've got a list of three here on the slides. There are others as well that are commercially available. A new Oxbow harvester you can just get with it all built in as a package for fourteen thousand five hundred dollars. You know that'll be installed. It'll be there. There's nothing the grower has to do other than turn the harvester on and go. Uh, obviously, there's data management and processing issues that are going to come along with it. But in terms of actually setting up the sensor, you should be good to go, and the dealer should be able to help you with that kind of stuff. Uh, Gregoire, same thing, at least for their GLS-8, which is their new dual bin machine. Uh, their 
release is somewhat limited. Uh, it's not on their larger G9 machine that we see being used here uh, in most of our vineyards, and it's not on their discharge conveyor machines, which is another thing that we often see here. Um, I would expect that to come over the next few years, although their system may is a little bit different. They're trying to do a lot to filter out noise mechanically rather than with software. So we'll see if they're able to phase that into their other types of harvesters. Um, so if you're keeping track, I've thrown a lot of numbers at you. You've got a very good system for around $25,000, $23,000. And that's about $5,000 less than we see the typical cost of adoption. And what I mean by that is when we see growers actually adopting this technology, they don't necessarily purchase the types of equipment that I've described so far. There's other stuff available. Uh, there's other production practices you can do in a variable rate way. So their focus on other activities uh, causes them to spend a little bit more and they don't necessarily get a full robust picture of their crop load. Uh, not necessarily a failure on their part, just I think if you're getting started, you should really focus on what production practice is most valuable to your, your bottom line. And for us, I would at least argue so far the evidence shows that it's crop load. I want to talk a little bit about that and why I'm, I keep saying this like it's a good conclusion. Um, so we did take a look at, at commercial yield monitors and what, what we can do with a crop load map. So this is what a commercial yield monitor is going to look like. Um, the yield relates more closely to gross revenue than any other measure. It's going to focus the attention of the grower on, on suboptimal results. And it's going to be able, the grower is going to be able to focus on sub block uh, portions of blocks rather than the whole block. Um, and again, it's go also going to help you with those yield adjustments in, in future years. So uh, as an, a couple of different examples, uh, there's, there's a chart here and there's an image here on the slide. Um, and these are two different years and two different thinning um, commercial trials, not research trials. And, um, or I should say, in the blue here, we've got a commercial vineyard that was actually supported by research. And then the, the table is actually just full on commercial uh, thinning that was not done with the aid of research at all. So what we saw was uh, with variable rate, um, with variable rate thinning, we saw a return crop of 1.5 tons in terms of an, an increase per acre while one ton was being removed. So the actual, the return crop was actually greater than what was removed, which is outside of what we expect in terms of efficiency and fruit thinning in our region. Uh, we did better uh, by about a half a ton than we would ever expect. Uh, this results in a pretty high return on investment, and uh, that extra half a ton uh, scales to a payback. If, if you were able to do this in the right conditions on a whole farm of 150 acres, which is about what our larger growers are, you're looking at a payback period of a year. Um, now, that being said, you have to actually wait for a year where conditions are right. And that is, can be the downside with this, with this technology and with crop load management. There are years where we don't actually need to do crop load management. Uh, as we shift more and more of our acreage to mechanized processes, uh, particularly uh, pruning, we see more and more late season crop load management. So the probability of this happening uh, continues to go up. Uh, rather than thinning one out of 10 years, we're looking at more like one out of three or one out of four. Uh, so you'd expect a payback period in three or four years uh, just by using this technology once. Uh, and now to sort of add to that return on investment, 2013, 2014, we had a significant number of our acreage that was thinned. Uh, each chart represents a different grower and we saw unthinned production fall uh, by 60% uh, all the way down to nothing. So we had a few blocks that didn't need thinning and quite a few that were dramatically hurt by not thinning. Um, those are all represented by the unthinned red lines. And on the green side, that's where we thinned. Just one second. 
on the green side where we thinned, we saw very mixed results. So 50% increase in return crop all the way down to no increase in return crop. So commercially growers struggle to, to sample their blocks enough to make sure that they need to thin and to make sure that they thin the right amount. This technology can significantly aid in that and in doing so would actually increase the, um, the return on investment above and beyond. So we would actually exceed the return, on, we would exceed our investment in less, less than a year if we were able to improve our results with thinning. So that one year payback period is based on comparing a commercial, commercially thin vineyard with what we expect those results to be based on a best case scenario in a research vineyard. Um, we could probably double that when we compare the results of sort of questionable results of growers that are unable to adequately sample all of their acreage. Okay, so the next thing that I would hope if you followed this timeline, uh, if, you, if you have not started ad adopting any of this technology at all, um, by the time you get to a BRICS monitor, it should be 2024, 2025. Uh, we don't, and that's great news for, for us because we do not have a, um, a commercially available BRICS monitor in a format that I would recommend investing in. Um, so by then we should. And I can sort of share with you where we're at and why you would want one. Um, so it assists in the validation of crop load. Uh, it makes sure that your crop is actually balanced. Uh, you probably already know that if you took pruning weights uh, and you validated your NDVI against your pruning weights, but this is going to give you some real-time data that supports that. Uh, for Concord, it's an industry benchmark of quality. So for us in the East, it basically means we can uh, dial in our harvest because this BRICS monitor would work in real time and it would allow us to make sure that we were meeting minimum quality standards and we were also meeting the quality standards that the grower wanted uh, to deliver that day. And those can be some pretty strategic decisions that result in two to three thousand dollar swings over the course of one day of harvesting, particularly in the first week of harvest. So if we can if we can get one grower to improve one load, it would probably justify under the right conditions justify the cost of the BRICS monitor. Uh, it might take two or three loads, but in a low bricks year, we would see payback in a year or two for a large grower. Um, so the state of development, I, in my view, the hard stuff has sort of been done. Um, the hardest thing, I think, was the, the I, I'm going to call the maceration process. So we now have adequate flow to our inline bricks monitor. Uh, we had uh, Andy and um, uh, Dan at our lab develop that technology and it seems to be working great. Um, the BRICS monitor itself, the data logger, and uh, actually hooking it up to your, like an ag leader display or a similar display, that's all co commercially available. So the actual hardware in terms of sensor and data logging and data processing, it's, we're already there. Um, I think we want to make sure that the actual mechanics of it that are validated and are um, in the harvester in a way that does not impede a, a grower from continuing his harvest at his normal pace. Uh, you know, it doesn't plug up, it doesn't cause a breakdown, he's able to wash his harvester the way he normally does. And I would think by 2020, 2021, maybe before, we'll get there. So I talked a little bit about adoption and practice and all of, all of the things we've seen. Um, one of the things that growers have focused on in our region is uh, mechanized variable rate fertilizer management. Uh, and this is going to cost more than converting a harvester for most of our growers. Typically, these machines are PTO driven machines. They need to be converted to hydraulics. Uh, the higher quality ones are ground driven. They would need to be converted to hydraulics. So this is going to be an additional cost of at least $5,000. Um, and then on top of that, they're still going to need the GPS, the display, the flow controller, all of very similar things that you would need to convert your harvester. So you're probably looking at at least $15,000 invested uh, just to do the, um, 
just to do the fertilizer spreader. Uh, a lot of our growers actually purchase new fertilizer spreaders when they do this. That's how they time it. Uh, that's not necessarily a cost that's associated with variable rate, but it certainly increased the total amount of capital they have in their equipment. So that increase the, increases the cost a little bit more. Um, and um, for us, at least in our, our region, we spend about $150 to $200 on fertilizer per year and a lot of that is sort of base fertilizer you're never really going to get below 50 to 75 dollars per year it's just what all the vines are going to need it's based on sort of what you're removing from the soil to grow a decent crop so so we really have a potential for savings on fertilizer of no more than at most a hundred dollars per acre where over application occurred uh, so we see a very long payback period and a very low ROI with fertilizer unless we can use variable rate fertilizer to improve, excuse me, to improve vine size. And we have not shown that yet. We, I think we just don't have the data and the decision making processes in a variable rate way to, to get there. Um, and uh, also pictured as an NDVI sensor. We are starting to see growers purchase those. Um, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Optrix is uh, one of the pieces of technology that would work pretty well with Ag Leader if that's your display. That's what's shown in the image. Um, that's NDVI only, and uh, you might be able to realize a bit of a cost savings. Those are frequently available, used, and your display can be your your uh, data logger as well. So, um, the Carnegie Mellon uh, imaging system is pictured on the slide as well. Uh, we expect that to be affordable as it becomes commercially available. It should be available through Bloomfield Robotics. Um, the focus there, at least in terms of gro actual grower adoption, has been in the West. And I think from an economic perspective, it can have a relatively uh, fast period of payback, probably a year or two. If, um, if it's implemented correctly. And that's sort of with all of this technology, the data processing side of things, uh, it's a learning curve for the growers and the industry and trying to a, a create a system where that's affordable, it has been a challenge and we're getting there with some of these activities and we're a little bit further away with others. Uh, we've talked to uh, dealers and people who have experience with managing this data for growers and the prices really just don't work on the scale that we're used to in the east with our small blocks it usually ends up being uh, at least forty dollars if not more per acre just to manage the data so we're looking at creating tools to allow growers to do that themselves rather than relying on consultants at least as much as possible um, so I do want to touch on our next webinar a little bit before Heather takes over. Um, we uh, will be having clips from the Shawless Symposium and highlights. Uh, if you are interested in getting involved in variable rate management, you can skip the highlight reel next month and just attend the conference. Uh, it will, hopefully we'll see you there. Um, and I've got Heather here with me to talk about the Loner Sensor Program and how that can help with adoption. and. Uh, how it's worked with our local growers. Hi, I'm Heather. Um, so we have what's called a loaner sensor program. It originally started because we had this technology for research purposes, but then it's like we should really be introducing this to the growers so that they can get a feel for it. And then when it maybe is developed commercially, they can go out and are comfortable purchasing their own equipment. So that is the end goal for the loaner sensor program is that growers are comfortable shopping for this equipment and implementing it in their vineyard operations. So the main component, I think Kevin mentioned this, is our crop circle NDVI canopy sensors. What they're measuring are the, is the normalized difference vegetation index. Um, it's basically reading how much green is out there. So that shows us differences in canopy vigor. We also have a soil sled. This cannot be loaned out for growers, like they can't walk out of here with that. Um, it costs about $23,000. So that's something we send out with a field technician. It measures soil electrical conductivity. So it's not 
telling you that this is clay, this is gravel. It's showing you where the line roughly is of where the soil types change. So going forward, a grower can take a map from a soil scan and decide where they want to sample their vineyard. We don't go out and do the sampling. Um, something you're going to have to decide if, like for extension agents, if you want to offer a program like this, you kind of have to decide what you're going to offer growers. If you are going to do a soil sled, um, are you going to go out and do the sampling? We don't. They bring it to us. They can submit it through um, our facility, but we don't physically go out there and sample the soil. There are upfront costs. Um, Kevin mentioned that. We have three sets of, of NDVI sensors. You can do scanning with one NDVI sensor and just go down like every row. We use a set of two and put one on either side of the vehicle so that we can go down every other row and it saves us quite a bit of time. Um, and then we have, so we have two sets that can be loaned out and then we have one that we keep back at the lab for research purposes. Um, we also have the soil sensor, which is a dual EM. Um, this doesn't break the soil, the surface of the soil. It glides along and it's reading electrical conductivity. And um, there are companies coming up out there that will do this for you. I have Helena up here. What you wanna make sure that if there is a company available to growers, you want them to be able to keep the data after. Like that should be theirs. Um, Helena does offer that. Um, before you do buy a soil sensor, make sure that it's worth it. You really only need your, your vineyard sensed once every five years for soil. That it's not gonna change as much as um, canopy vigor might. So if they're only gonna get it done once in a while, you might not really need to, to offer that to them but it would be the next step after you do canopy sensors and that's a really successful program, maybe look at adopting a soil sensor. And then of course you need the data loggers. So if you're gonna introduce a program like this, um, being there in person to talk about it is really important. You wanna be able to meet with growers, it, like we do coffee pot meetings, um, do demonstrations, bring the sensors out, show them how you connect it, it just, it makes it real and not as scary, like we're not, you can fly a drone over to get um, canopy readings, but these, uh, these are proximal sensors, correct? Yep. These are, I think, better for a, a loaner sensor program because they can be attached to sprayer equipment. So if you're gonna go out and um, attach it to, you can really do it to any farm vehicle, like, a gator, a four-wheeler, sprayers are great because then they're getting the sensing done during a normal vineyard operation. They're not spending extra time collecting that data. Uh, be available to set up the equipment with the grower. Be available, have a technician that can go out there, walk them through step by step so that when maybe they are considering getting this for themselves and if they see you setting it up, it's really not horribly complicated. It's, they'll pick it up. They're you know, they're familiar with equipment. Okay, so I said uh, attach it to the sprayer. I wanna make very clear, put it in the front of the sprayer, not the back so it's not covered with pesticide. And make that very clear to growers not to attach it to the back of the sprayer. Um, create boundaries for your program because, it, you know, they get busy. So if you say, yeah, go ahead, take this, you know, set it up, a lot of growers become comfortable with it and, you know, they might say, hey, I'm gonna be cruising by the facility. Can I come pick up the sensors? And you say, yeah, go ahead. I would like it back in three days. Make sure that they bring it back in three days. They get busy, they have stuff going on. They might just, you know, forget their get done. They forget it on their equipment. But if you don't make sure that it's back in those days, you're setting yourself up to have the sensors be broken simply by accident um, or lost or, you know, whatever. So create a spreadsheet um, that way, you might end up with kind of a busy schedule, which is what we're getting into because it has been so rainy. Um, make sure you know how many uh, acres are you trying to scan because if they're trying to do 650 acres in three days and it's been a wet spring like this, it's not gonna happen most likely. Um, and especially with soil scanning, if you have to send 
a technician out there to do that. You have to pay for that time. Um, a lot of times we take our own gator out there, so then you have to pay for the equipment and the gas to go out there, which is why we have um, our growers, if they want to be part of the loaner sensor program, they have to be members of our Lake Erie Regional Great Program. If they aren't members, they can't take loaner sensors. We won't come out and scan. Um, it makes it easier to stay in contact with them. They're already paying for the service in a way by paying to be part of the program. Um, oh yeah, uh, so if the acreage is spread out, this goes back to um, the time thing. Around here, sometimes growers will have, there's one grower that he's got some in Westfield, some in Northeast, some in Lake City. Well, if that's, if they have even not that many acres, but it's spread out, you have to account for the time that it takes you to load everything back up, take it down, get over there, set it back up in the new place, and then get back to scanning. Uh, I think it was maybe two weeks ago, we got, um, I think it was about 18 acres done. It took us one and a half, two hours, but then you have to drive there and set up. And then once you get there, you have to make sure that the sensors are lined up. So, um, you know, don't get too overextended with your, your timing, like be careful. You don't, you got to make sure that you're getting growers that are nearby and um, you don't want to spend half the day driving for, you know, a couple of acres. But if you have any questions, um, go to visit the efficientvineyard.com site. There's a loaner sensor program page up there. Um, and then you can also get into contact with me or um, an extension agent through the contact us page. So just a couple more things. Um, I think we finally got our sound fixed for real. And um, <clears throat> sorry about that, guys. Uh, if you do have any questions, you can hit us up in the chat box. Um, we do have some time to take some questions. And in addition to visiting efficientvineyard.com, uh, our producer, Kim, mentioned that the, um, the uh, webinar next month where we're posting highlights will actually probably be posted uh, around July 20th, and it won't be a live webinar. Uh, it will be highlights from that Shala Symposium, and it, it obviously won't be on July 9th since that takes place on the 18th and 19th. Um, so, so look for it around the week of July 20th or in, within the next few days after that, uh, if you're interested in seeing that, if you, if you can't make it to, to Geneva. Um, again, if you guys do have any questions, if not, the only other thing I'd like to emphasize is so the, the model of adoption that I've talked about exists because of uh, the fact that that's what's most important for the economic success of growers in our region. And I know we've got a few people in different areas doing different types of production. Um, maybe you're, you're in a warm climate and you know, you've got vinifera that are not on their own roots and, and crop load management, late season crop adjustment isn't what defines your bottom line. Uh, and if that's the case, I think you wanna think critically about which production practices are the most important and try to target those first with variable rate management. Um, you know, maybe they are fertilizer and maybe they're uh, canopy management. Um, some of our growers, they get very excited about this technology. They jump in head first and 50 or $60,000 later, they can do pretty much everything on their farm in a variable rate way. Um, that can be the end goal. I think that's that's fine as an end goal. Uh, a lot of this technology can be transferred from tractor to tractor and um, you, you are sharing a lot of that equipment uh, among your production practices. So that's not the end of the world, but it is very difficult to learn all of that technology and to get enough data to make all of those decisions in a variable rate way in a year or two. Uh, I think the learning curve is uh, a little bit challenging to try to do all of that in a year or two. So. Uh, it just makes more sense to slow down your adoption to the pace that you're, not just you as, as maybe an owner or an extension agent, but you as in uh, your whole business and your employees who will be using this technology uh, begin to understand it and you develop a database of information where you can make good decisions. Um, makes a lot of sense. So again, I want to thank all of you for joining us. We'll stay online for a minute or two and see if you have any questions, but if not, uh, we will catch you in August.
there's a question. So we do have one question. Do any of your sensors count clusters? Um, the Carnegie Mellon and I think soon to be available or available for a quote maybe uh, from the Bloomfield Robotics, that's, that sensor was designed to count clusters. Um, the only thing I would say is it obviously only counts clusters it can see. Uh, so it uses a stereo camera type of technology. It's not, does not have radar or anything that can see through grape leaves. Um, so the more clusters that are exposed, depending on the trellis system, the better that works. And Terry says it counts berries, not clusters, which I would assume if you have your, your berry weights is probably better than counting clusters anyway, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. But um, yes, so it'll count the berries that it can see, not the ones it can't. And you know, you can do a little bit of data manipulation with that because it's never gonna see them all. But if it sees 5% of them in, in like you might see in a, a Concord vineyard where it has a downward growth pattern on top wire cordon, it, it's not particularly useful. And, have a nice open canopy on BSP, it might work really well. 